Hello and welcome to Double AI, the podcast on analytics and showtime is perhaps the most rare time of the last century in Major League Baseball. I'm Phil in Los Angeles. Say hello to our data scientist, Ari in Chicago. Hey, Ari. Hey, Phil. Hey, Andrew. And Andrew in San Diego. Good to have you back hello. with us, Andrew. Good to be back. Well, guys, uh, we have the rarest of the rare. Uh, Shohei Otani uh, deserves all that we can dish out right now. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Ari, you want to lead us through this? Yeah, he, uh, he is the first player in 100 years since the babe himself to start on the mound, also leading the league in home runs. Uh, so he can hit, he can pitch, as people know, and went two for three with two RBIs and three runs scored, and he even bunted for a hit on the offense. And on the mound, retiring 13 in a row and striking out nine over five innings in that victory, I think it was nine to four, and it was his first official win uh, since May of 2018. Um, and hitting incredibly, 300 with uh, seven home runs and, um, you know, the traditional early season stat, but yeah, do, doing extremely well. One other interesting note, um, uh, speaking of pitchers, is uh, DeGrom has done so phenomenally well this year. He has one earned run, which is fewer than the number of runs he scored himself. So he himself scored three times while only allowing one earned run the whole season. Well, analytics is our calling card. And Andrew, I'm going to ask you this. When I woke up this morning, uh, everything Shohei was the top result on everything Major League Baseball or MLB.com. How do you think Major League Baseball today has measured the amount of coverage globally and in the States, and the amount of tension that Shohei is generating right now? Well, I mean, I think this was the hope when he came over, right? He was a huge star in Japan. And we've already seen the crossover power of Japanese stars coming to uh, Major League Baseball. And they're absolutely tracking this and they're absolutely trying to grow the game outside of the United States. This is the intent, not just of Major League Baseball, but really all of the major sports leagues and not just North American sports leagues, but worldwide. But in many regards, you couldn't ask for a better guy to get that attention. He's so humble. He is the humble megastar. Even his teammates give him a lot of credit. Now, let's keep our uh, calling card theme, analytics. All right, the Kansas City Royals are in first place, and they have the best record in Major League Baseball for the first time since their World Series winning uh, season 2015. All right, you have worked with and you are friends with Mike Matheny, their manager. Name something the Royals are doing that makes sense in an analytic frame of mind. Well, um, yeah, great to see. And, and I was just thinking 2015 and the year before 2014, uh, the Baltimore Orioles uh, went against them to get to the World Series. It was tough to lose to them. You know, back then, they had a lot of winning combinations. Their uh, stadium and their outfield defense was one of the things that was like a buzzsaw uh, that, that kind of killed us. All the balls that were hit pretty hard um, were, were kind of tracked down in uh, Kaufman Stadium. But yeah, they continue to have that success that they did uh, six years ago. Pretty much everything, you know, pitching, hitting, uh, and, and defense. Well, and I look at uh, lineup construction of what uh, Mike is doing with his lineup. It's slightly different from previous, and I have to believe that that's one influence he's having on the organization, on the big club. Yeah, and, and yeah, in addition, you know, his, one of the reasons he was hired was uh, also his leadership skills. Yeah. So leading them, you know, through the COVID, through the grind, uh, you know, many young players, that, that's what he did. He has, he's known, he did really well in Little League uh, coaching um, all the way up, but, you know, managing, uh, you know, relatively young people is, uh, you know, something that maybe less statistical, but more, uh, you know, a, a contribution to their success this year. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say it again. I, I think the way he's put together the batting order now is different from the manner in which he did it when he was St. Louis. And we'll give our colleague some credit for uh, the relationship that he has with Mike on that. All right, let's move on. Now, the second thing is not the NFL draft, uh, but the second thing 
might be the biggest thing globally, Andrew, and a major controversial trend that should be the biggest story on the planet this week. And it, it was a, a really well-written story on The Athletic. Yeah, absolutely. We've spent a lot of time when we talk about European football talking about the betting culture and the way betting is embedded in that entire um, space. But leading back to our conversation about Otani and the globalization of the game, um, this story really begins to show where English Premier League teams think their money is. And so it was recently announced that Southampton signed a uh, record sponsorship deal of $10 million with sportsbet.io. Um, and you think, well, that's nothing. A lot of these teams have sponsorship deals with Betfair and various companies like that. But sportsbet.io is a really interesting company because if you're in the UK and you go to sportsbet.io, you get one page and it's a very traditional British betting page um, where you put money in through normal means and you bet. If you're outside of the UK and you do the same thing, you go to a very different page where everything's in um, cryptocurrency. And now there's a number of issues with this. For the first one, in the UK and actually in many of the um, Western countries with strong anti-money laundering laws, you know your customer laws would prevent them from taking bets in cryptocurrency because they can't tell where the money's coming from. It would almost certainly run afoul of the anti-money laundering rules in both the UK or the US. Um, so what is going on here? Uh, sportsbet.io is not really advertising to the British customer. This is all about the Chinese customer, the Singapore customer, um, people in Macau. Um, and in fact, you even see this in some of the advertising that the advertising will appear on a Southampton pitch in Chinese with references to hold, H-O-D-L, which is a very common word in the cryptocurrency uh, space. Um, so we're, we're seeing the collision of massive gambling, the English Premier League and everyone's interest in the Chinese market um, and betting all come together in just a massive storm. Yeah, uh, it draws a straight line from London to Macau. Yeah. Is that fair, Andrew? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it's worth watching. Now, uh, it also, light of day, shed on all of a full range of topics with regard to the recent Super League uh, uh, blow up and uh, dust, dust up and blow up. What's some of the fallout from that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm sorry I wasn't here last week to talk about this. This was one of the biggest stories yeah. I've been tracking in a long time. Um, the one thing that you may have talked about last week was that a number of the people involved are actually U.S. billionaires and sports owners who what they really wanted was a U.S. style league, mm -hmm. um, right? So the Glazer family owns the Bucks um, and Man U. Henry owns the Red Sox and Liverpool. Um, and the Kroenke family owns the Rams and Arsenal. Um, and we're beginning to see some of that fallout at Arsenal. Now, to be fair, the Arsenal fans have been mad at Kroenke basically since he bought the team. Um, and some of that is that they're not performing the way they did a decade ago. And they're just blaming the owner for perhaps other decisions. Um, but the fans were protesting outside of a game on Friday at Kroenke over the entire Super League thing. And then the fallout started. Um, the co-founder and CEO of Spotify, Daniel Ek, um, is interested in buying the team from the Kroenke family. And he's not alone in this. Um, Arsenal legends and members of the Invincible team that went undefeated in the Premier League in the early 2000s and actually led Arsenal to one of their greatest periods of uh, performance. Pierre Henry, Dennis Bergkamp, and Patrick Vieira are also interested in joining his group to purchase the club. Um, now, Kroenke, of course, said he's 100% committed to the club. He's not interested in selling at all. He is a businessman. Um, the rumors are suggesting that he'd like about $2 billion, which is about 2 point, or 2 billion pounds, 
which is about $2.8 billion. Um, and the people who understand X background, um, he's worth almost $4 billion from Spotify. They don't think he'd have any trouble coming up with the cash to buy out the current, the family if he was truly interested. Well, Kroenke, if you follow his business exploits, uh, has always been a, a buy and hold investor. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what, uh, uh, what unfolds from here. Good insight, Andrew. Well done. We missed having you with us uh, a week ago. 21-year-old rising star Colton Herta led all but three of 100 laps, winning the uh, St. Pete Grand Prix in Florida. IndyCar now moves on to Texas, then Indianapolis. Guys, we're tiptoeing into May. Uh, Indianapolis 500 the last week of May. The Kentucky Derby the first week of May. Uh, and so we have the Kentucky Derby coming up. Uh, Essential Quality, the early Kentucky Derby favorite at 5-2 to two for Saturday's race. Hot Rod Charlie, number two so far, and the things are uh, mismatched after that. Hot Rod Charlie at 6-1. to um, It would be interesting to see what happens with Twin Spires and how uh, the Kentucky Derby and Churchill Downs has embraced sports betting as well, right at the leading edge. And then, uh, Ari, if we start the month, and I, guys, I remember Jim McKay, the old ABC Wide World of Sports. Mm -hmm. He always loved the month of May. It's poetic. May springs across the country with the start of the Derby at the beginning of May and the Indy 500 at the end of May. And Ari, that brings us to you. Uh, with a little bit of luck, uh, we may see you in the pits at Indianapolis for the Grand Prix in the middle of the month and maybe for the Indy 500 at the end of the month. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I do plan to go there. Actually, I am going there, so we'll see if I get into the pit or not. Last time was pretty tremendous uh, during the actual racing, seeing the cars stop and, and go and you know, did the start signal. But yeah, inc incredible experience to see how behind the scenes it all comes together and in Indy is, li is like the big one. So uh, can't wait, can't wait for it. And then tell more about it in a future podcast. It'll be interesting to see what happens there because uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway uh, plans to have just under 50%, uh, about 40% capacity. The rest of racing, and we're going to keep an eye on this all the way through 2021. Brad Keselowski won at Talladega on the high banks last week. Uh, Joey Logano survived an airborne crash. That was spectacular. Next up for the NASCAR guys, they go to the Midwest in Kansas. Formula One has a really big month on the continent. After the uh, uh, rain-soaked uh, Italian Grand Prix, they're in Portugal this weekend, then Spain, then Monaco the same weekend for the big Indy 500. That's one of the biggest days in racing all year. All right, Andrew, Ari, if you wanted some action in the NFL draft and we put it off till the end, the real action, Andrew, is not the number one pick or the number two, but it is, go ahead. It is what are the 49ers going to do with the third pick? Um, and we've been, the, the community has been talking about this, many, many rumors uh, about what the 49ers were going to do. And they just keep adding uh, fuel to the fire every time they open their mouth, talking about not knowing about what their quarterback is going to be or if he's even going to be alive by this weekend. Really weird stuff, right? Um, but right now, Mac Jones is the odds-on favorite to go third overall to the 49ers, not Justin Fields. Well, and that sets up the rest of things to fall in place. And guys, we talk about gambling, prop betting, sports betting uh, unabashedly because we know that's where uh, analytics are and where the industry is today. Here's what's interesting. So the action's on that third spot. And the Niners are really not hiding right now. What are they thinking, Mac Jones? But the over-under on the first round could get interesting. It's set at four and a half quarterbacks selected in the first round. That means if uh, the first three are quarterbacks, then you get into juggling. Is it Justin Fields? Is it Trey Lance? And uh, it'll be interesting to see how uh, the smart guys handle that between now and on the draft on Saturday. Now, Ari, let's play to your strength as a former Nielsen uh, 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 employee and leader. 
Uh, the Oscar audience has a lot of chatter here in Los Angeles since Sunday night. Yeah, and, and being in Chicago, um, having lived in LA, yeah, the, it's chatter, you know, very local to Southern California in many ways. And the movie industry had one of the most, uh, you know, riveting ones in that movie theaters were closed. Uh, not every movie was distributed in home right away. So people across the country, uh, you know, weren't familiar with the movies. Um, don't want to sound like an old, you know, uh, person, but like I didn't recognize half of the names uh, that were out there. Um, but it, 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 that's representative of the global audience. Uh, you know, that change uh, combined with many other factors saw a drop enormously by 60% of viewership of the Oscar television audience. So th th that's by far, you know, you know, the lowest in recent years. It's, it was fewer than 10 million viewers. So 1.9 rating after 5.3 last year uh, during the pandemic um, and a 7.7 .7 in the year before. So last year had the smallest viewership of, of recent times at 23.6 million. 2018 had the prior smallest at 26.5. And this year was under 10, about 9.85 million. So one, one famous line is train wreck at uh, Union Station. Well, guys, we've all been borderline entertainment industry guys for a long time. I, I, I think I'm about 40 years now in and out of the entertainment industry on a regular basis. I don't think people are tired of going to movies or watching them on different forms of streaming platforms. I think they have worn thin on the award show genre. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I think a gradual, gradual drop off and then someone's foot slipped on the precipice. Uh, at the same time, fellas, I don't know if you heard this, but uh, the Oscars swept out uh, the homeless community from Union Station a week before, and coverage of that was not mainstream here in Los Angeles. And it only came out a day after, on Monday, a day after the Oscars, that our friends in the entertainment community forced out the homeless community from Union Station and surrounding that. And if you've ever been to Union Station uh, and you are from this part of the country, you know what that means. No one knows where they were forced to go, but they were forced out for that week for the cleanup. And that seems incongruous. And I would say that incongruity is uh, imbued throughout award show mentality and programming these days. And that's part of why that genre has slipped somewhat in its appeal for viewership. Fair to say, Andrew? I think it's fair to say. It's also just a function of the changing viewership habits of uh, the 20 and 30 year olds who yep. aren't as interested in long form, especially and in many cases aren't watching TV at all. Well, a, fo a four hour marathon on a Sunday night or four and a half uh, that is both self-congratulating and full of personal and social incongruity may not be in line with today's 20, 30, and 40-year-old viewers. Ari, would you agree with that? Yes, I, I see the big trend, <laughs> like binge-watching these Netflix series or Hulu series and yeah. you know, these new industries where you're, uh, you know, watching 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And it's not like the actual movie. And to your point, Phil, People are, are, you know, still do love movies, but as a percentage of the options that you're watching, it's getting smaller and smaller. Yeah, no longer hooray for Hollywood, but okay, not bad for Hollywood. There we go. Well, not bad for us. That'll do it for this week of Double AI, the podcast on analytics and sports and entertainment occasionally. I'm really grateful to have Andrew back with us, and it's always fun to spend time with Ari and with you as well. And we'll see you back here next week on Double AI. Take care.